The problem is that it infiltrated also the media, education. I mean, if you've seen the, uh, the unbelievable scene of Ivy League presidents yeah. uh, from uh, UPenn, Harvard. I mean, what, what, what was that? What was that? It's very simple. Do you condemn the attack on Jews? Yes or no? It depends. That's what they were answered. That's why they were fired or resigned. But we arrived to a position or to a place where you are actually afraid to condemn an attack on someone just because he is white, black, Jew, Christian, Muslim. You're afraid actually to say specifically about Jews because those universities are being funded by people right. who are actually anti-Semites. <laughs>person with brown skin who is not a Jew who is a full citizen and attains equal rights in Israel and is smiling and is uh, not under attack at this hotel well at least from Israel surprise surprise I'm shocked I, I mean I mean you know you said the uh, brown not Jew but here's the thing only 33% of the Jews in Israel are actually white. Right. The rest are There's a lot of brown, brown people on the beach. black. <laughs> and of course, you have uh, 2 million Arabs, which they are 20% of the entire Israeli population. And if we're already in it, just uh, about the smiling uh, face, there is a reason why I smile. Of course, you know, uh, I'm determined also to uh, fix the problems that we have in our country. And we do have. It's not like Israel is a perfect uh, country, I think. You know, I know there isn't such thing as a perfect country, just like any other country in the world. And yes, racism and discrimination exist also here. So the good news is that those things are, a, when I call it a, in every community, but in a minority extremists, in every community. And that's the good news. Uh, the bad news is that those uh, minority extremists are uh, loud, uh, they're violent, and they will do absolutely everything, including threaten you, in order to silence you. But I'm smiling because I live in Israel, which is a democracy. I can uh, say my uh, uh, thoughts and uh, opinions uh, without uh, having the uh, fear of being arrested or even killed. Now, if you're asking me why I am saying it like this, because if I compare Israel to any other Middle East Arab country, in any of those countries, you are not free. And this is not me saying it. It's according to one of the uh, top organizations that categorize each country if they are free or not, Freedom House. Mm -hmm. And Freedom House categorized only uh, Israel as a free country in the Middle East. And the bigger smile is, we're 20% of the population, the Arab Israelis, but take this. We are 30% of the doctors in Israel, 50% hmm. of the pharmacists in Israel. And it can go on and on and on and on and on. But that's why the smile. And on the Supreme Court. And, and actually, as many people have told me on the streets in the last two days, you know, with everything that has happened since October 7th, the Arab-Israeli population, the Israelis who just happen to be Arab, uh, have been perfectly peaceful. They're, they're doing their part. They're helping in the oh, communities and all of that. those things. It's yeah. even more than yeah, that. Yeah, tell me. By, by the way, you, you talked about, uh, you know, Supreme Court. Uh, there's a huge story that happened here, basically that, that shreds all the uh, apartheid myth when they talk about Israel being an apartheid country. It's uh, quite funny because uh, according to Amnesty International, uh, one of the biggest human rights organizations, I live, I as an Arab from Israel, live under apartheid regime. I have no idea. Well, I do actually have an idea yeah. how they came to that conclusion because I had a debate against them in, in the Irish parliament. But the audacity of white Europeans telling me that I live under apartheid regime, where, well, I know that I don't live under apartheid regime, and I started all this by talking about the Supreme Court. We had a Supreme Court judge, a former Supreme Court judge, by the name of Salim Gibran. What's so unique about Salim Gibran is that he was actually on the team of judges that sent to prison, are you ready for this, a Jewish prime minister? and a Jewish president. It was 
Ehud Olmert as yeah. a prime minister for committing crimes, and Moshe Katsav as a president who committed also uh, sexual assault. An Arab judge sent them to prison. Now, think about that sentence. Mm -hmm. And see, anyone yeah. who says that Israel is an apartheid state, certainly about the Arabs who live in Israel are only imbeciles. But further than that, even, if you take a look at the achievement of the Arab society in every aspect, I, I talked about uh, you know, medicine, I talked about the uh, uh, Supreme Court, you know, even in sports, we're also succeeding. Up until a few months ago, the captain of the football national team was a Muslim. His name is Biblas Natcho. The top scorer of the under 19 of the Israeli football team, Anan Khalaili, an Arab Israeli. There's a reason why I also keep giving names because I want people to go and search those names and, and see that those are actually real names. And as for the 7th of October, I mean, the partnership between Jews and Arabs. We saw that on the 7th of October, how Jews and Arabs saved each other. And further than that, we saw the shared faith against terrorism when Hamas killed, massacred Jews and Arabs yeah. and kidnapped Jews and Arabs. Right, Hamas made no distinction when they were killing people, whether they were Jewish or Arab, or whether they were Filipino or anything else. Let me tell you even uh, more than that. They did. And in fact, when they understood that you are an Arab, that when they shot even more bullets. Because for them, if you're an Arab here, you're a collaborator. They will put a bullet in you before anybody else. That's a critical information. Yeah. And further than that, uh, you know, uh, yesterday, Ali is Zayadni. His brother is hostage by Hamas in Gaza and his nephew as well, Hamza. Yesterday, he confronted uh, Riyad Mansour, which is the ambassador, the Palestinian ambassador in the UN. He confronted him with an unbelievable scene. It was videotaped. And you see, the uh, brother, Ali, comes to the ambassador, the Palestinian ambassador to the UN, and he tells him, you released Thailandese and you didn't release Muslims. Where are my children? Where are my brother? Where are my nephew? It's Ramadan. And he shouted, like he really went all full on him. And you know what was his response? The audacity of that imbecile, the uh, ambassador of the Palestinians uh, to the UN, he says, don't let the Israelis use you. Huh. The audacity. Use us? Use us? Hamas are the one who entered and massacred us. Hamas are the one who kidnapped Jews and Arabs. Hamas are the one who's holding uh, hostages, uh, uh, Yusuf and uh, Hamza. Not the Israelis. In fact, my country, Israel, are trying to do absolutely everything in order to release those hostages. Exactly like we did with Aisha and Bilal. Also, relative to Ali, who also were kidnapped but released by Israel. And you know why they were released? Because, because Israel paid such a really unbelievable uh, uh, price. We released six deadly terrorists in order to bring back Aisha and Bilal, as we should. Because we want, first of all, to take care of our citizens. But the fact is that now there are six deadly terrorists on the streets. That's the price that Israel is willing to pay in order to bring any of their citizens back home and it doesn't matter whether they're a Jew or an Arab. How do you think people got so confused about this? I've been to Israel, my first time in Israel was 1997. I think this is my sixth time here. I, I've seen it. I, I've seen people like you. Um, it's great to finally meet you. I, I just was telling you, you were in Miami right when I left and, I was, and everybody was like, you gotta go see this guy. I said, I'll see him in Israel. Uh, but how do you think the world got so confused as to what the reality on the ground in this country really is. It's a well-oiled machine, propaganda machine by anti-Israeli organization, BDS organization, funded by states like Qatar, who supports terrorism. Qatar, by the way, is the owner of Al Jazeera channel. Mm -hmm. Al Jazeera channel is by definition the official spokesman of Hamas. Let me tell you even further than that. If I, as an Arab, watched, watched only Al Jazeera, I would be number one in sight against Israel. Yeah. Number one. I would hate Israel. I would, I would, I would absolutely join everyone. The because left, the lefties in America love it. Of course, they're watching Al Jazeera in English. Same messages. Same messages. And the problem is that it infiltrated also the media, education. I mean, 
you've seen the uh, the unbelievable scene of Ivy League presidents yeah. uh, from uh, UPenn, Harvard. I mean, what, what, what was that? What was that? It's very simple. Do you condemn the attack on Jews? Yes or no? It depends. That's what they were answered. That's why they were fired or resigned. But we arrived to a position or to a place where you are actually afraid to condemn an attack on someone just because he is white, black, Jew, Christian, Muslim. You're afraid actually to say specifically about Jews because those universities are being funded by people who are actually anti-Semites. So add this and add the fact that they infiltrated everywhere and the fact that also they're going for the weak. For the ignorance, the easy ones to brainwash, and you get the result that we got result uh, that, that we have today. Plus, we're asleep. We, as a country, as as Israelis, we left this arena only for the Palestinians and the anti-Israelis, and only from the seventh of October, when, as a country, as a collective, we understand how much is important to do exactly what organizations like the anti-Israeli organizations are already doing for years and years. W were you asleep too? Because no. obviously they're doing a lot of this in Arabic. If you speak Hebrew, you don't speak Arabic. Obviously a lot of people speak both or whatever it might be, but there's often, it's sort of lost in translation, so to speak. Absolutely not. I've been, uh, I've been busting my ass for the last uh, seven years, trying to uh, wake a lot of people. Uh, unfortunately, there are evidence to that because, you know, all on air. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the saddest part was uh, on uh, last April, uh, April 2023, uh, just a few months before the attack. And I was hosted on an Israeli channel. And I said, guys, and this is a sentence that uh, I put here in, in, in the Israeli society. I said, let the IDF speak the language of the Middle East. Let the IDF speak Arabic. Now, when I say speak Arabic, not literally, yeah. not marhaba, shul akhbar, kif al hal, no. Yeah. The language of the Middle East when it comes to terrorism and their supporters. And it's simple. I'll give you an example. July 2023, Hezbollah decided to set up a tent in an Israeli territory, not a disputed territory, not in the Lebanese territory close to the border with Israel, in an Israeli territory. What do you think Israel did? Nothing. They went in to try to solve this in a diplomatic way. Now, here's the thing. What is perceived as a maturity and strength in the West, here in the Middle East, mm -hmm. is perceived as weakness. If it was up to me, by 7.01, this tent should have been back to Lebanon. And if they don't, one second later, there's a huge hole with a bunch of terrorists in it. That's how you speak Arabic in the Middle East. That's the language of determination against the terrorism. And when I was interviewed on uh, April, I said, guys, if we don't do that, if we're not going to allow the IDF to speak Arabic in the Middle East, and if we're not going to um, destroy the terrorist organization Hamas, they're going to come after us. And as long as we don't do that, we're going to keep pushing the faith that is ahead of us. And if we keep pushing, we're going to pay more and more. Then the 7th of October came, which is the worst disaster that happened to Israel since its creation. So is that the irony of what's happening in Gaza right now, that Israel is fighting a war to, to sort of placate the West or, you know, drop leaflets, move here, you know, which no other army has ever done in the history of warfare. And yet what you're saying is in a weird way that's weakness as opposed because every other country in the Middle East would have just gone in, done whatever the hell they would have done. And by the way, the world wouldn't have cared. After 9-11, the United States and its ally embarked on the war against the Taliban. In the process, they managed to uh, eliminate 38,000 Taliban terrorists. But also in that process, they killed 428,000 innocent people. The ratio here is, for every one dead terrorist, you have 12 innocent people dead. Do you know what is the ratio in Gaza and the IDF? 
I know just because I'm here. It's one to one, one to two. Is it one is to two? Yeah. For so far, the Palestinian Minister of Health, which is Hamas, they said that the, about thirty thousand Palestinians were killed. The IDF said that over ten thousand terrorists they managed to eliminate. Now, uh, if you ask me whether I trust a terrorist organization or an army of a democratic country, I will trust an army of a democratic country. Uh, which means for every one dead terrorist, we have two innocent lives. But here's the thing. If you want to blame someone, blame Hamas. Because on the 6th of October, there was a ceasefire. On the 7th of October, they invaded Israel. They massacred us. They raped our women, beheaded our babies, burned entire families alive. Kids watched their parents burn to death. Parents watched their kids burn to death. And then they kidnapped. Israelis, Arabs, and Jews. If you want to blame someone for what's happening in Gaza, blame Hamas for doing that. And after then, run like cowards and hide like rats under the ground, leaving their own people up there. And further than that, they hide among them. No, this is not me saying that. I have evidence from Gaza. Palestinians are sharing that. In fact, one of the uh, most unique videos that there were is from Al Jazeera, live. When a reporter from Al Jazeera went to uh, interview uh, a Palestinian in Al Shifa hospital in Gaza, and the Palestinian said, what, oh, about, uh, what about Hamas yeah. hiding among us? Let them go hide in hell. And immediately he, he took the microphone. <laughs> right. You understand the suffer of the Palestinians, yet the people in the West, they don't even care about the Palestinians. And that is something that I really find very hard to comprehend. I mean, I mean Hamas is actually using every tactic in order to harm their civilians, they even fight with the civilian clothes. They're not fighting with their, with their uniforms. They're doing every tactic. They're putting uh, 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 bombs under mosques, under UNRWA schools. I was in Gaza. I went to an UNRWA school and I saw those stars on my own eyes. No one can tell me otherwise. No one. And further than that, we saw the videos of UNRWA teacher helped to kidnap, yeah. kidnap an Israeli and have two Israelis in their attic. Those are not UNRWA teachers and those are not innocents. They are pure terrorists, pure terrorists. And that's how, why the, 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 the condition in Gaza is solely the responsibility of the terrorist organization Hamas. Yet, despite all those challenges and despite the unfair war, the IDF is doing an unbelievable job that I don't think any army in the world would do. So what do you think should happen now? I mean, that we're, we're, it seems like the, the army's on the border of Rafah right now. The American administration kind of seems to want to stop them. Uh, that's basically where the hostages are if they're alive. And, and even if they're not alive, that's probably where the bodies are. It's I mean, crammed, it's messy. Here's the deal. If it was up to me, of course. Release all our hostages. Let's start by that. And then we're going to provide you with humanitarian aid, whatever it necessary to provide Gazans with food and supply and medicine. That offer has basically been there. For, exactly. For, yeah. Of course. Yeah. But who is preventing that? Hamas. Yeah. They don't want... You guys kidnapped our people. What do you expect from us? If it was to anyone, if it was to your family, what do you expect from your own country to do if it was your brother, your sister, yeah. your kid, your father, your grandfather, if it was him who was kidnapped by a terrorist organization? What do you expect from your country to do? Now, based on everything, if they release our hostages, then everything would be easier. Then we will start negotiate the negotiation on how we can send Hamas terrorists outside of Gaza and rebuild Gaza with local new uh, leaders. But if they don't, Israel is obligated obligated to enter Rafah and to do absolutely everything to bring back the hostages and destroy the terrorist organization Hamas. But this is not actually the steps that need to be taken because this could happen every moment and, and it should happen if they don't release our hostages. But what happened after? And here is people are trying to avoid this, but actually there's only one solution. Those who understand the Middle East, and those who understand how Gaza works, know that there's only one solution to that. And this solution can take several years. In order for us not to fool anybody and actually to destroy the terrorist organization Hamas, we have to take control of every inch of Gaza. 
And the IDF, as you saw, is capable of doing that. We have to allow the IDF to do that. First, for the security of the Israeli, both Arabs and Jews, here in the state of Israel, but also for the freedom of the Palestinians in Gaza, because they are actually suffering under the terrorist organization Hamas. Now, you take control of every inch of Gaza, you move to the second step, which is a temporary military authority by the IDF, where we control both security and the civil uh, uh, rights of Gaza. But at the, and, um, at, the, at the same time, when we are controlling everything with firm uh, and, and, and with strength and power, we start talking to what we call it the tribes. Each territory in Gaza and each city and then each neighborhood is controlled by a tribe. Mm -hmm. It could be Al Masri, it could be Nasser, it could be Al Baghdadi, it could be many things. Okay? There are so many families there. The head of the tribe, he's the one to talk to. And he controls everything in his own tribe and his own family. And based on that, everybody will do. Israel will have to come to that head of the tribe, to each and every one of those head of the tribes and says, either you with us, which means you are willing to live side by side as, as, as a Israel independent state, Jewish and democratic. And if you do so, we're with you. And we're gonna rehabilitate Gaza and we're gonna do absolutely everything in order to bring you better life. But if you're against us, you're gonna be in jail and we're gonna talk to the next on, in line. And if he's against us, we're going to keep doing that until someone comes and be in line with us. You do that and you bring all the chief of the tribes to work with us. And they will because they know that Israel eventually will do absolutely everything to rehabilitate Gaza. And they want to live, especially after years and years of depression from the terrorist organization Hamas. Then you start pulling first bite from the civil rights, let them manage it. And then with the international community, with Saudi Arabia, for instance, with the Emirates, United States, we can create a force that step by step Israel will pull from every inch of Gaza and then together will work in order to rehabilitate. It is several years. It will cost also quite heavy loss from our side. But the alternative is way worse because if Hamas stays in power, we're going to see the 7th of October again and again and bigger. Can you talk a little bit about how the Arab world, at least from my estimation, so I don't want to put words in your mouth, but from where I sit, the Arab world basically uses the Palestinians. It's, it's sort of the crux that they use to bludgeon everybody else with, and they don't really care. Egypt could open up the border, Sinai's empty. This could be over tomorrow if they wanted. You, you, you could say that it's in my own words as well, because, you know, let me give you an example of Jordan. You know, Jordan, an actual apartheid nation. <laughs> It's, it's, it's actually, if it wasn't sad, it's funny. Yeah. Jordan has a peace agreement with Israel. And we have many projects together. And Israel supplies water to Jordan. The queen of Jordan cannot stop talk. Yeah. Nonsense about Israel. Just yeah. uh, this morning, her quote was, Israel suffered from one seventh of October. The Palestinians are suffering from multiple seventh of October uh, through the entire uh, decades or whatever it is. She, so might she might want to look back to 1972. <laughs> not, not only that, you know, the audacity, not but just from her, from, from the Jordanians. I mean... You go and you join South Africa and sued Israel uh, for committing genocide. Well, you guys, especially the king, knows the truth. And he knows that this will go down to hell. Nobody will care. And eventually you saw the court did not uh, say that Israel is committing a genocide. And it was obvious that this is the result. But why do you think Jordan did that? The, the, all this is just to bring you to that word that you said. They're playing them. They're giving them false hopes. They're telling them, oh, we joined the uh, uh, court the, uh, to sue Israel. We're the only Arab nation to do that because we want to stand with our brothers. 70% of the Jordanians are actually Palestinians. We want to stand with our brothers. And they don't have equal rights. Is that and not they, correct? Under the Hashemite kingdom, the Palestinians do not have equal rights. In Lebanon, the same thing. Yeah, in you Lebanon, can't you, cannot have, yeah. you cannot be a doctor. You cannot they have uh, your own land. Uh, uh, there are so many things. But, but, but the thing is that 
you, you see the audacity and you see also how they're fooling everybody because everybody in Gaza, oh, we love Jordan. Jordan are the only one who's uh, with us. But at the same time, Jordan is maintaining every uh, uh, diplomatic relationship uh, with Israel. And in fact, Jordan are the ones that put troops on their border uh, to prevent from Jordanians or Palestinians to cross to Israel and, uh, you know, uh, right. try to invade. So they're fooling them. Egypt is fooling them. Everybody is fooling them. Saudi Arabia, I mean, you should have he he heard here and listen to the former ambassador to the U.S. Uh, 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 from Saudi Arabia. The things he said about Yasser Arafat, the, thing, the things that he said about the Palestinians in an epic, epic uh, uh, interview that he gave to the El Arabiya channel, uh, when he said that uh, many times, he, he admitted it, many times we know that the Palestinians are just lying. And we know that the Israelis on the right side. But because, you know, they're the Palestinians, we stood next to them. But we know that they're lying. He's admitting it. We have it on record. Yeah. And he's talking about Yasser Arafat, how he is a thief and a liar. And he is a thief and a liar. And a terrorist. So, I, I, you'd seen also Al Jazeera. Al Jazeera is number one, can I say bullshit state? Oh, you can say bullshit. You can say bullshit here. Well, thank you very much. It's number one bullshit channel in the world. I'm not joking. They have this... Uh, uh, a person who analyzes the, what's going on in Gaza. His name is uh, Dueri. This guy is disattached from reality like uh, I think he's living in the moon or something like this. To that extent. But they're giving him amount of time on air because they want this bullshit to be mm -hmm. on air because they want to brainwash the Arab world. But what do you make of how they're brainwashing the West, though? It's one thing to brainwash the Arab world and speak in their language and the rest of it. But what about how they're brainwashing because, the West? Because without the West, you cannot actually do what they're trying to do in the campuses and what they're trying to do in the UN, what they're trying to do to other organizations. And of course, uh, through the international courts. Without all this, you cannot. If you keep it in the Arab world, nobody cares. Yeah. Nobody cares. But, but it is a crazy uh, question. Huh? Take a look at all of the people who are going out to protest in all the Western countries. Look at the majority of the protesters. Of course you have locals from every country, of course. But look at the majority. The majority of those protesters are not from that same country. The majority of them are immigrants from dictatorship country. They fled because their own leader is either raping their own families, or killing them, they have no freedom. So they run away, seek asylum in the West. And what they do, instead of endorse it, instead of becoming part of it, instead of live as free, they're abusing the democracy. They're abusing the West. You can see that clearly when they take down an American flag to put up a Palestinian flag, if you really want to uh, fight for your cause, at least raise the Palestinian flag alongside the American one. Don't take one. What do you? S and then you ask them. You ask them. Uh, people are asking. Uh, I saw people are asking in Canada. Are you going to obey the law of our country? He said no. They say no. Yeah, we yeah. want to bring our laws, and you should be bound to those laws. So you're coming to a Western country to to have your freedom in this world. And you're using that freedom in order to become a, a, a dictatorship? Again, haven't you learned from where you run away, you ignorant idiots? And so, so, so there are ignorance and there are idiots. And this is exactly the same people that the anti-Israelis and the BDS organizations are targeting and they're succeeding. Uh, I promise you, if you will do this again, this is not going to be the only time we sit down because this is the message that I think the world needs to hear from someone besides one of those white Jews that apparently they, they don't want to listen to yeah. uh, or don't want to always don't, hear the message don't, from. Don't, don't, uh, don't be worried because every time I come and uh, I have a debate with anti-Israelis, yeah. they uh, immediately for them an Arab should be against Israel. Therefore, right. I'm not an Arab right. uh, they, for them. They which take is, that away which is, which is a racist comment. This is who I am because I stand with my country. My country. Then you decided that I'm not an Arab. That's like the most racist thing that I ever uh, encountered. So let me ask you one other thing. With all of this being said, 
Um, people are definitely worried on the streets. They're worried for the country. I feel there's a, there's a tenuous feeling here. Um, what would you say is the, the positive outlook a- after this? On the 7th of October, no, on the 6th of October, the Israeli society was divided because of interior political issues. Yeah, I, I was here. Yeah. On the 7th of October, while still people thought that Israelis won't come and volunteer and serve in the IDF as reserves on duty because of the political conflict, over 130% enlistment to the reserve on duty in less than 12 hours. Arabs and Jews, left and right, secular and religion. When I was in Gaza, I met all those soldiers from all those communities. They said to me one thing, when you go back to Israel, please send a message to the entire Israeli society. Here in Gaza, we're fighting for our freedom, for our country, and we're fighting to bring back the hostages. There is no Arab Jews. There's no right, left. There's no secular or uh, religion. No, we're all Israelis. We're all fighting together. We need the whole Israeli society to be united in order for us to have more strength to continue to do the job. On the 7th of October, I saw unbelievable and unique stories. Stories like Yusuf Zayadni, who was a, a driver at the Nova party. And when he was asked by a journalist, when bullets were flying away above your head, why didn't you run away? Do you know what was the answer of an Arab Muslim from the city of Rahat? He said, I'm an Israeli and there were Israelis there. Why would I run away? He ended up saving over 33 Israelis. A few weeks ago, I met with a police officer by the name of Remo El Huzel, an Arab Muslim as well. Remo El Huzel ended up eliminating several terrorists and saving lives of Israelis, but further than that. He ended up finding a car that was still running and in the span of three hours, managed to bring over 300 Israelis to a safety. Three hours, go back and forth, go back and forth, just putting Israelis to bring them to safety. Stories like Awad Daraushi, the paramedic, who came to Nova party to save, uh, to save Israelis after Hamas shot them, but then Hamas killed him. Stories of Arab Israelis uh, 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 donating their uh, trucks and even driving themselves from the north to the south in order to bring supply to the IDF and the people of the south. Arab Israeli businessmen and women donating millions of shekels to Israeli uh, civilians in the, so- uh, in the south and to IDF soldiers. I know some of those businessmen and women myself. These are the things that I want everyone to understand that is existing in the Israeli society. The fact that the whole Israeli society united. Everybody thought that said Israel is divided. It's the weakest time to strike. They were wrong. They were wrong. And this is the only positive thing that I can take from this disaster. Because for us, there will be no, more, no win, even if we destroy Hamas. Even if we bring all our hostages back home, for us there's no win. Because when you lose 1,200 Israelis, when you lose so many soldiers in battle, even if you kill 10 times more terrorists, okay? And even if you destroy the entire Gaza Strip, there's no win. We could uh, arrive to the situation where we secured ourselves, but winning is off the table. So... Therefore, the Israeli society being united is the thing that should hold us. And that's what I'm working on. Every time, every minute that I have from the 7th of October, every place I have the opportunity, every platform that I have to send a message to our citizens, to our uh, 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 society, we must stay united. If we're united, no one can beat us. It's been an honor. Thank you very much for having me.